What is up, nerds? Welcome back again. As always, my name is Nate in the Wild, and it is so good to see you here. Uh, as you may have seen, I've recently been working on a video project centered around skiing, which means tons of fast-moving action shots, tracking shots, and of course, follow cams. Now, we originally began this project with an A7S III on a gimbal, which worked really well, but it did leave us wanting a little more. Specifically, a gimbal only stabilizes on three axes, which is great, but skiing is an inherently bumpy ride. And so, in our journey for a truly stable, perfect looking tracking shot on the slopes, I reached out to my friends at b and Photo and they sent me a DJI Ronin 4D. I know I'm a little bit late to the game talking about this camera, but using it left me exactly halfway torn between this is the greatest innovation in photography since the digital sensor and why would anyone want this thing? So I figured we should have a little chat about that. There are dozens of videos out there talking about the specs for this camera, so I'm gonna skip a lot of that and instead dive into what made me fall in love with it and what also baffles me to the extent where I don't know if I'll ever actually buy one unless some serious updates are made to the firmware. So, like most cinema cameras, the Ronin 4D has a large camera brain connected to an image sensor. Uh, but what makes this camera so spectacular is that the sensor is located on a four-axis gimbal stabilizer. This is absolutely revolutionary because that fourth axis of motion happens with every single step we take, and it's very difficult to compensate for without lots of large and expensive equipment, like an easy rig, and also you just look like a total dweeb. Now this brings me to the first point about this camera that I absolutely love, and that's the incredibly smooth footage that you can get out of this camera with very little effort. There is a time and a place for somewhat shaky handheld footage. It can really lend a more human feel to your shots, and if that that's something you want, you can actually lock the gimbal out and use the 4D as a standard video camera. But for me, I love that ultra smooth footage with nice slow moves. Uh, for me, it feels more immersive. It takes the viewer out of watching footage and into living the footage. Now, I don't want anything that reminds the viewer that this was shot on a camera and edited on a computer. I want them to feel like they are personally moving through the scene and ultra smooth Stable footage is the best way to accomplish that. Prior to this camera, the only way to really get those super smooth dolly caliber shots was to use a slider. Sliders work well, but they take 10 to 15 minutes to set up per shot. And also it's just a lot of extra gear to carry into the field. And so for my style of fast moving run and gun style filmmaking, cutting out all that extra setup and breakdown is just revolutionary and life-changing for my work. It's incredible how fast and reactive the gimbal is and how smooth and beautiful the footage is that comes out of this camera. We're literally skiing 30 to 45 miles per hour and the camera has handled that with aplomb. The top handle is way, way easier to use than a standard gimbal and the fourth axis of stabilization comes in crazy handy for something like skiing that has tons of Z-axis motion. Uh, I film a lot of trail running and hiking footage during the summer, and I genuinely can't wait to try this camera out for that as well. The other thing I love about this camera is the ergonomics. Now, I will admit that when somebody mentions camera ergonomics in reference to a Sony or Fuji grip being the wrong size for their weak little baby fingers, I roll my eyes so hard that my skull almost caves in. But there is a science to camera ergonomics, and I feel that DJI absolutely nailed it with this one. This camera is quite a bit heavier than an RS2 gimbal with a Sony mirrorless camera on it, but the ergonomics are so good that they more than counteract that additional weight. Uh, to start, the top handle is a perfect balance point for carrying the camera while walking, running, or skiing. Uh, I love the monitor mount right here. Uh, easily adjustable while shooting in any orientation, and it's bright enough to use outside in full sun. Uh, they also gave this little top handle a limited joystick for adjusting the gimbal position uh, and orientation while on the fly, which is very, very nice. Uh, it's a very nice start for a rudimentary run and gun setup, but where things really start to get beautiful is when you add on these side handles. First of all, they basically just pop right on in a couple of seconds each, which saves valuable setup time on set. I've already mentioned how important that is to me. And they have a ridiculously easy adjustment lever for tilting them up and down, which keeps the handles super ergonomic no matter where you're holding the camera, above your head, down on the ground, right at your belly button, etc. The handles are fitted with buttons, kind of like gaming joysticks, uh, for basically any camera function you could need, including 
autofocus on off toggle, focus peaking toggle, a joystick for gimbal control, a record button, and more. The part that gets me most excited on these handles though is the focus wheel on the right side. It's super easy to control with just a thumb while you're holding the camera, plus it has a graduated automatic snapback for the autofocus, meaning you can lock autofocus onto your subject and then do smooth focus racks that auto stops when your subject is in focus. The amount of resistance on the wheel is graduated, meaning that it changes uh, and it increases the further out of focus you are as well. So. Uh, you know exactly how close you are to being back in focus, which makes it super easy to do perfectly smooth focus pulls of any speed. This is one of those features that might seem a little boring, but it genuinely made me a better filmmaker within seconds of turning on the camera. Focus pulls are very much not my forte, so anything that can help me nail that shot on the first take is a major bonus to me. The camera also comes with this LiDAR focusing system right on the top that essentially gives you a top-down view of your scene and shows you exactly how far away your subject is, as well as your focus zone, which makes manual focusing a breeze even with moving subjects. I did find that this feature works fantastic within a range of about 10 meters, and more or less works not at all outside of that range. So uh, this is the first iteration of this camera, so I'd like to think that future versions will improve on this technology, and it has the potential to really be game-changing in the long run. I also love that the camera features an interchangeable lens mount. So for just a little extra money, I can switch the entire camera to an E-mount, and then I can continue to use my huge library of Sony lenses, rather than needing to invest in a whole new lens ecosystem when I buy a cinema camera. Uh, it also has the absolute coolest camera monitor I've ever seen with quick access buttons for everything from ISO to shutter speed, aperture, frame rate, even white balance. Plus it has touchscreen controls for all of that, as well as a little knob on the side for scrolling through the menus. It is so intuitive and easy to change settings on this camera, it genuinely made me sad to go back to my other systems. Uh, I'm also a huge fan of the internal ND filters, which are just incredible and saved me a ton of time during filming because I didn't have to mess with step-up rings and variable ND filters each and every time I change lenses. That is fairly standard for high-end cinema cameras, but it's nice that they chose to include it on the Ronin 4D as well. However, there are a few things about this camera that I really don't like. First off, I'm a little bummed that they went with the DJI TB50 battery instead of a more industry standard battery like V-mount or gold mount. I understand why they did it, because they're trying to keep everything in the DJI ecosystem, especially if you own an Inspire drone, etc. But they are taking a lot of affordable third-party batteries off the table, and for somebody like me who already owns a dozen batteries of each variety, needing to invest uh, an entirely new battery system is pretty annoying. Now, speaking of proprietary, there is a DJI brand one terabyte SSD that you can use for internal recording, but unsurprisingly, it's about triple the price you'd expect for a terabyte of storage. The camera does feature CF Express type B slots, but bafflingly, not every CF Express card is compatible. Even cards from a supported manufacturer that just happen to have different storage capacity may not be usable. So if you already own a bunch of CF Express cards, you might buy this camera and then find out that only some or none of your existing cards are actually compatible. I'm assuming additional cards can be added to the compatibility list with a firmware update, but it's honestly kind of insane to me that this camera has been out for over a year and a half and they haven't released that update yet. In the meantime, every card purchase needs to be preceded by a healthy dose of stringent research. The one thing that really bothers me the most is the nearly incomprehensible matrix of frame rates, aspect ratios, and compression codecs that all intertwine in this camera. When I'm directing a project, I want to be able to choose my settings based on the shot I want to get, meaning I want to choose if a shot is 4K at 24 frames per second or 4K at 60 or 120 frames per second. And I need my camera to be able to make that switch right off the bat with very little effort and absolutely without forcing me to compromise on my other settings. However, on this camera, if you're shooting in 4K at 24 FPS and the next sequence has some action, so you increase the frame rate to 60 frames per second so you can do a little slow motion, this seems like a reasonable idea, right? Well, unfortunately, on the Ronin 4D, switching to 60 FPS forces you to change your aspect ratio from 17.9 to 2.4 to 1. Okay, well, I've filmed my entire project so far at 17.9, so it'd be a little weird to have little black bars at the top and bottom of my screen for just a couple shots, so I don't want that, 
Great news, you can shoot 4K60 and keep that 17-9 aspect ratio as long as you change from full frame to super 35 crops. So now all of your shots are zoomed in 40% and has your composition completely changed. Uh, okay, well, let's go to 120 frames per second instead. Oh, so now it changes my aspect ratio and forces a super 35 crop. It doesn't make any sense to me. If I want a 17-9 ratio, 4K 120 footage, the only option is to shoot it in ProRes 4444 XQ codec in Super 35 crop mode, which by the way requires you to purchase DJI's proprietary $700 SSD. You cannot shoot in ProRes 422 or ProRes RAW or H.264, and there is no option for full frame 4K 120 at all. In fact, there are five different ways to shoot 4K 120, but none of them are full frame and four of them will force an aspect ratio change. It's honestly just a gigantic cluster and I am amazed they shipped the camera with this complicated of a layout. Now, you might be saying, well, Nate, why don't you just shoot your entire project in 2.4 to 1 ratio? That cinematic widescreen look is super hot right now. And while you're totally right that that would be a functional workaround, this is nearly a $10,000 camera when you finally get it fully set up. It should help me bring my vision to life. It should not force me to create something different than my vision to compensate for the camera's weaknesses. The camera is a tool for me to create what I want to create. It shouldn't be an Achilles heel that forces me to change my strategy. Also, I don't personally like that super widescreen look. I'm a huge fan of mountains and trees and tall things. I don't want to lose 25% of my screen in the vertical direction. To me, it is nearly an unforgivable sin to release a camera this expensive targeted at professional filmmakers that forces the user to switch between complicated aspect ratios, sensor crop, and compression codecs. I have cameras that are literally a third the price of this that don't require any thought at all when changing frame rates. In fact, I have a camera that uses the exact same sensor that's inside the Ronin 4D that can film 4K at any frame rate without forcing you to change crop or aspect ratio. It can be done, DJI just didn't. Now, a slightly smaller drawback for the camera is that the built-in gimbal does limit your lens choice, of course, because you're not going to be balancing a 70 to 200 on this thing, let alone a full wildlife lens uh, like a 400 or 600 millimeter prime. But thanks to the new flex attachment, or I guess uh, detachment that just came out, you can lock the sensor off as an independent item and use longer lenses on a tripod, so that sort of solves the problem, but it's not quite as quick and seamless as it would be with a true cinema camera like RED or a Sony FX6 or FX9. Um, if I'm being honest, I am struggling a little bit with how I want to end this video because I have such mixed emotions about this camera. On the one hand, it's utterly revolutionary and it has completely changed my filmmaking. It opened doors to me for shots I didn't know I could get with such little effort and it simplified my creative process in some truly incredible ways. On the other hand, the limitations are severe and as I said before, nearly unforgivable shortcomings. Forcing crops and ratio changes is a huge deal breaker for me. And as much as I love shooting with this camera, I genuinely don't think I'll ever buy one until they iron out those kinks. Now, in theory, this could all be changed with a firmware update, but this camera has been out for over 18 months as of this recording. And the fact that these issues still exist makes me think that these are not a priority for DJI at this time. In fact, DJI has been promising to release the 8K version of this camera for a year and a half also, and we still haven't seen a single update since then. So it honestly makes me a bit worried that DJI is using this camera for the publicity and has no genuine interest in working to keep it functional for professionals. That said, I would love to hear your thoughts on it in the comments below. Are the issues I listed enough to be deal breakers for you? Is the stabilization worth it to ignore the shortcomings? Is this camera the future of filmmaking? Let me know in the comments below, please. I genuinely am curious how you all feel about it. Uh, and until next time, thanks for watching and stay nerdy.